Today, it's all about getting results. Have you ever tried forcing something year after year after year and it not happening for you? Well, today I'm going to introduce a different way of doing that. Well, it's actually not me going to be introducing it. It's actually Diane Collins. She is an original thinker, media personality, and one of the foremost thought leaders of our time. She has been interested in lots of different things, and she's been very successful at all the different things she's been doing. She now consults companies like Accenture, AT&T, CNN, and DuPont, as well as entrepreneurs and students of all sorts of different types. She's written a book called Do You Quantum Think? New thinking that will rock your world. Diane, where are you signing in from? I am in Sunny Isles Beach, which is an area of Miami Beach, Florida, USA. And it's a beautiful day here, Erland. I must say, like, my favorite places in the U.S., Miami, New York, San Francisco. Those are, those are the go-to places that I go. And <laughs> Me I've, too. I've spent I'm a right lot of time in Miami. You. Love it. Great. Well, you have to call us when you're here next. Definitely, definitely. I was actually meant to go on the, um, the Marketeers cruise um, in, in January uh, this year, um, last year. No, this year. This year. There's one next in January now. It's their 10th anniversary. Um, so and they're leaving from Miami. So maybe, maybe you should check that out if you heard of it. Well, you know, I think I have some friends who went on that that. Cool. Uh, that cruise yeah it's a, and, it's a good uh, uh, it's, it's supposed to be really really good for networking and learning new things i'm sure it is i'm not a cruise person so <laughs> <laughs> me neither uh, but i I, thought, I, I don't do cruises <laughs> i thought it would, it would be a fun way to do a workation so when you travel and, and and work at the same time oh yeah very much so so quantum thinking i mean uh, a lot of people view sort of spiritual people quantum thinking you know the secret i've kind of seen two reactions to the secret uh, and other quantum programs it's either like uh that's bullshit or of course it works i've manifested so many things in my life um how did you get interested in in quantum thinking and um and why did you decide to uh, to spend your life um teaching other people how to do it well It's what you said in the very uh, beginning of your introduction to the show, to the podcast, Erland, and that is that we all want results. And so whether you, for me, you know, what is life all about? It's about mastering our ability to create life as we would like it. And not only for ourselves, it's not just a self-centered, selfish thing, but for ourselves, for our families, communities, country, the world, and the future of the world. And so for me, it was really very logical. As I was growing up, I thought, well, we all want what we want. So that fits into we want an inner experience, you know, how do we experience life moment by moment, which is mostly how we live life, right? And we want our relational experiences, how we communicate, how we connect with others. And we have the outer, you know, houses, money, and cars. And so that's really what led me on it is I thought, well, in order to to create what you want in life, you would have to know the dynamics of creation that we as human beings, ordinary human beings, have been born with. Now, that led me, of course, on the search, and this really started probably when I was born. I mean, I remember actually questioning when I was four years old, but let's say in the teenage years, And I started reading uh, a lot of philosophical books, metaphysical books, uh, uh, and along the way, you come across as you think, so you become. And, you know, as you mentioned about the secret and and all these things that are now in, in current times, but we know that over the years, this has been by 
uh, spiritual masters. The Buddha said all that we are is a result of what we have thought. The Bible reads, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, the Upanishads say, as a man, you know, at per, at what a person thinks is what he becomes. So it's been said in many, many different ways. And, you know, the prosperity uh, consciousness people, both earlier years in the 20th century and modern. And so I thought, okay, as you think, so you become. Your habits of thinking give rise to your actions and therefore to all of your results. And Mike had two questions, <laughs> vexing questions, Erlen. I thought, if all you had to do was change your thought to change your life to change the world, why does it still look the way it does? You know, why did it, why was it so challenging? Or why do you read the news headlines and everything looks like about the opposite of what people think? aspire to in terms of living the virtues and creating harmony and peace on earth if, you know one billion <laughs> holiday cards are sent <laughs> affirming peace on earth peace on earth peace on earth but meanwhile it's not happening so hence the bs point of view that you mentioned right but so i thought i have to look deeper into this and as i did I came across uh, a friend who be who became my mentor, who is a quantum physicist, Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, and uh, he wrote the the foreword to my book, "Do Quantum Think?" And he's people may know him because he's prominent in the in the movie "What the Bleep Do We Know?" and "The Secret." He's in that too. But anyway, great, brilliant man, mind on the planet. And we were working on a project together, and uh, he showed me that scientists make discoveries, and they create new terminology when they do it. And when they create this new ter terminology, it, it starts to shape the way we think. So I use in the book the most common example, quantum leap. So... The quantum leap, that term came from the father of uh, quantum mechanics, one of them, Max Planck, uh, because he made the discovery energy doesn't move in a smooth, continuous way. It bursts and leaps in packets of energy that he called quanta, hence the term quantum, which really meant the smallest measurable unit. Now, quantum thinking, by the way, is not about science. <laughs> It's about how the discoveries of science have shaped the way we think and how we need to use the new discoveries to be more in sync with nature. We're out of sync with the nature of nature. But just to finish on this point about quantum leap, so hence the term quantum leap, these quantum jumps. Now, in the English language, that term, as far as my research, came into our language around the year 1927. So, I, as I say, you couldn't think of a quantum leap before 1927. Okay, we're too young for that, but you get the point. So, what my revelation was, which led me to create quantum thinking, which is what you asked me, is that, wait a minute... It's not, oh, just to finish on the quantum leap. And so that terminology comes into our language. And when it comes into the language, it comes into our thinking. This is a really crucial point. And it begins to shape our lives. So that today, in everyday, you know, parlance, in everyday language, when we say quantum think, we know, I mean, quantum leap, we know what it means. You know, something discontinuous with the past. Something that looks like, you know, something very tiny be cre created a huge result. And something that you couldn't follow a traceable, linear, logical path, ordinary logic. There's no connection like a cause and effect connection in a quantum leap. It's just completely discontinuous what's gone beyond it, before it rather. So what I was getting back, what my revelation, Erlen, was is that it's not just one 
term. It's not just one word. It's not just one discovery. System. So I realize we're in, you know, why is it that, you know, we're complaining and there's all this either or going on and, you know, we're focused on, you know, are you conservative? Are you liberal? Are you black? Are you white? Are you gay? Are you straight? And, you know, all these different things, why is it there, you know, I thought, what if there's nothing wrong with us? What if it's just that our thinking has been shaped? by an old worldview, a limited worldview from the industrial age, the 17th, started in the 17th century, gave rise to machines that is a very, very limited wor- worldview, a, a limited and highly inaccurate in many ways way of relating to what's possible in the world and so this is in the so here's the the bottom line we're in a quantum age we have all the greater information we have you know we have a little bit here a little bit there we understand about oh meditation that's good for our health uh our thoughts you know affect the chemicals in our body our habits of thinking of course as i was saying give rise to our actions and therefore all of our results uh and you know people talk about mindsets i listened to some of your shows as i said i was listening to alan because (laughs) he was the manager for Djokovic. i'm a big tennis fan and player so it was like you know all these different things that we have a little smattering of visualization uh, you know, create your intention and uh, subtle energy. How do we tune into it? And what I thought, there's something, you know, missing in all of it because thinking like everything in this universe, it's a universe of systems and thinking is a system and the thinking is based in the system of the overarching worldview. And it's silently playing out in the background so that we don't even realize it. So I thought, if I could put this all together, and the interesting thing is, when I encountered quantum physics, which is way before I actually met Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, uh, and I read the book Tao of Physics, by Fritjof Capra, and that was when I first realized, oh, this is very cool that the new science, the quantum science, is now verifying the wisdom that is universal in all mastery traditions, the wisdom of principles like that we exist in fields, that the fields are invisible, that the fields are full of energy and information, intelligent energy, the fields are conscious, and that we exchange, we have exchange of information, and uh, there are that mind-to-mind and mind-to-matter effects and influences are real, that we live in a world that is holistic and holographic, it's whole systems, that we as human observers, this is the key core principle of quantum physics, the observer effect, that I say it very simply, what you bring is what you get, what you bring to your observation is what you get. And, you know, it's said by many writers throughout history and, you know, that the world is as you see it. So I thought I could put this all together. The insights from quantum science, which is a completely different reality system than what's known as the classical mechanical worldview that was began in the 17th century. And I could say it's just like a completely that was a matter-based reality where the scientists said probably to get away from the clergy and the church only physical matter is real you know leave i say leave the spirit on the side and hold the soul but that we know but it was always like a sideline thing so when you look at that was a matter-based 
physical-based reality. What's this quantum science that began with Einstein, E equals MC squared, and the quantum scientists that followed it? A mind-based, a mind-based, oh, wait a minute, the universe is more like a giant mind than a giant machine. And yet, when you look at, so when you're quantum thinking, you're able to make a distinction. If thinking creates reality, the question becomes, what's creating your thinking? So I put it all together in a system of thinking that I like entertainment, so I wrote it and I write it, I have been told (laughs) entertainingly I like things simple let's take this very complex thing and make it simple and easy for people 21 principles and practices for the mind and awareness that kick in as a system and all of a sudden you've made a literal quantum leap in consciousness in your perspective so it's not like you're sitting there saying uh I created an intention, you know, the the reason people get upset with the the secret is that there is obvious validity to it, but if you see it, you don't see it in the context of the whole system. So, can you, you, what do you mean when you say that? You don't see it in context of the whole system, what does that mean? It means that, for example... I make a distinction between intent and intention, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the secret is based on resonance. You know, what is the secret? I I can't remember exactly how they all, I know it's a lot of people. I saw the DVD. I know the guy who marketed it, but whatever. And it's obviously, it's striking a chord but when you look at just that in isolation so why do I make a distinction between intent and intention because intention you could think of as an end goal the measurable part of your goal that happens in a future whereas intent when you understand the dynamics of mind and by the way this is essential It's not just, oh, here, uh, if you have a thought and you create an intention, it's all going to work out. You know, you'll have a million dollars in your bank account tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. First, you have to get related to the actual dynamics of mind, which I call the five natural faculties. The first one being intent. Intent is an activating force. So intent, you could say... It's not a future goal. It's a statement that you are generating as a context that you're choosing to live from. And what intent does as a statement, so like if we were applying it to money, right? You might have a goal, want to make $10 million in my business next year, right? Well, 10 million profit, profit. Profit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very important distinction. Speaking, of, see, the art of distinguishing a new worldview of learning. That's one of the principles in quantum physics. Is how we learn. So now you could have that as an intention. Ten million dollars in profit in my business. Now, how are you having that? thought alone. Obviously, we're going to be taking actions because being alive on this planet means taking action. So there's always action and strategy and tactics and all that. We're not leaving that out. But where does it, where is it sourced from? Intent. Because resonance is a fact. And what that means is what we resonate We know this, and this is sometimes referred to as law of attraction. I don't particularly use that languaging, but okay. Uh, Resonance is what we emanate. And because of the science that's known as sympathetic resonance, which means you're going to, you know, attract, things attract to one another, are created, objects are actually built through 
a sympathetic resonance. You're in the same frequency range. So we're talking technical, but it becomes very simple. You walk into a room, one corner of people, they're happy and you know, exuberant. The other corner, they're grumbling and complaining like a black cloud over that group. And where are you going to be? You know, depending on where you are, you're going to resonate over here, hopefully, with the happy group. So it's something that we as human beings, we have, we're like a giant sensing device. We're a multi-dimensional sensing device. We can we sense things energetically. We sense things through mind. We sense things through heart. We, and so all of the above. So getting back, a statement of intent w- would be not based in current circumstances. Now, this is the difference between positive thinking and quantum thinking. When you're quantum thinking, you realize that there's no fixed reality. Industrial age saw the world as a set of fixed, solid objects. Mm-hmm. World, we look separate. We look separate from it. Looks like there's some external environment out there, right? An objective reality. Let's call that circumstances that we have to somehow exert a force on and push or pull to get it happen. Again, going back to your intro line where you said it, Erlen, you know, like you're pushing and pulling on circumstances and still nothing is happening. But when you're quantum thinking, you have the knowledge that there, that the nature of reality is that it's energy in flux informed by intelligence. Everything is shifting and changing all the time. And what has it settle into a manifest reality is what we as the human observer, as the fortunate focal points, whatever we focus on, that becomes the reality. That's it. Whatever you have in your mind right now is your reality right now. So this is what the Buddha meant by all is mine. There's nothing outside of it. So in quantum think what we're doing is we're learning to master the principles of mind, the faculties of mind that we never learned in conventional education. Why? Because conventional education and all the systems and structures that we're living in today, that's why they're crumbling and we need the new thinking, is because they're born under the thinking of the old world view. Only physical matter is real. So we learn about the brain. Okay, let me just say what, that... What, what kind of systems are crumbling? What, what, what does that mean? What, I'll what? say that in a second, but let mm. me just give okay. the intent statement so that listeners understand in this conversation with us. So an intent statement would be something open-ended, not based in circumstance. It would be based in the fact that you know reality is context-dependent and I can choose the context. So a context around this 10 million profit in my business would be I'm let you could say I'm really happy about the how my business is unfolding financially and the profit is growing and you see it's not an end measurable result but it is narrowing the infinite possibility field that we live in into a probability wave field. So you're saying, I'm going to live from that. You know, it's as simple as glass half empty, half full. I'm, the, the amount of water in the glass is the same. And how am I going to choose? And again, this has to do with mastery of your mind. Okay. I had to say that because I wanted to complete it for people. And my husband, Alan, who's my partner in everything in life and business, master quantum thing coach, he always says, oh, you know, you went in circles and you have to complete the conversation. So thanks for letting (laughs) me finish that. So now getting to what are the systems that are crumbling, right? Mm. The institutions. Well, when we, we know... We're in a very different world, and we have more knowledge. We have this quantum, we, let's call it quantum knowledge for short, right? So we know, for example, the systems such as the medical institution. The medical institution was formed 
under that, what I lovingly call the old worldview thinking. By the way, we're not writing in the new worldview of the quantum world for the old world, but the old worldview is one system, limited as it is, inside of the more all-encompassing one. So when you look at universe as machine, they saw the body as machine. And the thinking was, if you could divide up this machine into its parts and figure out the constituents of it, you know, what is it made of and how does it work in this cause and effect dynamic, a machine, right? Press on that and that moves. That's how we viewed the body. So when you look at the medical institution, and with the exception, of course, of the Eastern cultures who had that ancient wisdom, right, who saw the body as more holistic. And I'm not even saying they saw it as totally holistic, because as someone points out, the meridians of the acupuncture system was only still looking at that one system. But you have to look multidimensionally. So that's what I mean. So the medical institution, you know, you have something wrong with your shoulder. Well, they're not looking at how is that related to your knee. That's an example. Or, or cut it off, you know, cut it off, take a pill, uh, you know, isolate a substance in research. You know, you discover that this particular substance will act on, you know, what is causing depression and and then you know take this but you're not looking at well how is that affecting the rest of your body so that's one example makes sense absolutely yeah and then another example is that uh, what I was saying about the education system now this is huge because if we have the updated knowledge that it's really mind which is fundamental to everything else, your relationship to your, to your faculties of mind, intent, intuition, subtle energy, resonance, meditation, which I consider a faculty, a natural faculty, and to know how these things work and fit together. And yet, we're not learning that if that and our the other thing is having a masterful relationship with our patterns of thinking with our habits of thinking and i say you make a th- distinction between a thought that you initiate consciously with the awareness like you're choosing it and a thought that just visits because we are in fields and a lot of the thoughts we have are not even our own they're just coming in and you're picking up or you're latching on to it you're identifying with every thought that happens to cross your i call it the thoughtosphere <laughs> your mind field and then wondering why do you feel crappy you know it's so what i say is you can make that distinction, you'll free you up forever. It's like, okay, wait a minute, I didn't choose that thought. Let that go by. What's my intent? So the education system, if we're brought up without any kind of knowledge, I mean, what do we learn about the mind? We learn the psychology, which is really analysis. And I'm not saying it's not helpful. I, I find that in and of itself, depending on, you know, how enlightened a therapist may be, and this is going to be a little maverick, but it's a little bit outdated unless a therapist really has the, uh, the, the knowledge, the up-to-date and accurate knowledge about the faculties of mind. Because if you just go into analysis, okay, your behavior is this way because your mother told you when you were four years old, you were never going to make it. You know, I mean, that is just not helpful. It's in that sense, it's irrelevant when you're quantum thinking, because when you're quantum thinking, you know that you can shift things in an instant, and and people do. But anyway, so the education system, isn't it logical, Erlen? If mind is the generator of your experience, and therefore of all your results in life, shouldn't you learn something about the nature of mind, not the psychology of mind? 
and not just the brain alone, the brain being a transmitter receiver of this intelligent field we all live in, that we can say infinite mind, universal mind, but we need to learn that. So those are some of the examples of what I mean by, Mm -hmm. and just even looking in politics, I mean, you, you know, you're from London, living in Norway right now. I know you travel a lot. And so I'm not familiar with all the political systems around the world. But when you look at it, and I'm in the United States, so our, actually our system is borrowed, right, from Great Britain, that you look at it and it's created from the thinking which is either or. Now that's one of the things of the industrial age worldview. It's either or thinking as distinct from both and thinking of the quantum world. Is energy, is it a particle or a wave? It's both and you have and more. So it's how they work together. So when you think, how did it map onto us as just ordinary, everyday thinking human beings. Well, in the, in the industrial age, and they said, well, they wanted to predict, the, analyze the matter, you know, what is it, what's the physical reality, so that they could predict and control nature. So when you think about prediction, you have to say, well, it's either this way or that way. It's either, how could it be both? And so that's what I mean by limitation of that model of looking at reality. So how did that map on to politics, government? You look at it and you say, oh, two-party system, right? Mm -hmm. And then, like in the United States, the two-party system, and it's similar around the world in Australia. Again, I don't know every party. And, of course, we know there's other things like dictatorships and all different kind of things. But let's say in this kind of, you know, modern system that Democrats and Republicans, well, we're not really looking at the person, the candidate. How do they think? You know, what are their views? It's like if, if you don't go along with, quote, the party line, this is how we get into this automaticity, this mechanicality of being that none of us in our heart of hearts really even want. It's just as I say, blame it on the old world view. Maybe there's nothing wrong with us, Earl, and maybe it was just that we are surpassing, transcending a level of human development, a level of evolution that is no longer relevant or effective in the modern world. I think one of the... One of the um aspects of learning about you know quantum thinking is is so if if your thoughts are creating a reality um you know when you have bad thoughts or negative thoughts um which are often coming you know they're they're coming from somewhere right and some often like if you do a lot of meditation you don't really act on them so you're kind of like oh what's that thought why is that thought coming and um I mean, I, I, I kind of started meditating um, five years ago, about five years ago. And that's the first time I started, you know, consciously seeing my thoughts on a diff, in a different way. You know, mm-hmm. I, 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 I saw my thoughts before that, but it was more like, I, yeah, it was just on another level. And obviously, the, the longer I meditate, the more conscious I become. Um, but there, I still have, you know, negative thoughts. I still go like, oh, look at that person or, you know, who, do, who, do, uh, he, who does he think he is? You know, mm-hmm. uh, oh, mm-hmm. I, I, I really don't want to lose this client, you know, etc. And, and the, those things uh, come up and then what happens? Uh, do they manifest instantly? Should, I mean, I don't like having those kind of thoughts. I don't want to have them, but I still get them. Right. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Join the human race, right? <laughs> now, that is why, now, what I call these thoughts, I gave a label for it. 
least action pathways, least hyphen action being one, one term, least action pathways I borrowed from science. It means the way the energy goes or the thought simply because it's been that route before. So these are these automatic thoughts, those judgments. And I love what you said, Erlen, because you said, I don't want that thought. And that happens to me, too. But, you know, a lot of times, I've said this on the air before, where I'm taking a shower and, you know, water and it makes us, you know, the mind, I let my mind drift. And all of a sudden, you're focused on some kind of scenario that's giving you an experience you don't want, like what you just said. And I just say to myself, wait a minute, I don't want that thought. Let me pick something else, you know. And so this, what happens is that the interesting uh, word that you said in this is you said, my thought, my thought. And this is where I think we can make the shift because we don't have to own every thought that happens to cross our our you know, local mind field and that we really, you, we'll never really know where those thoughts came from. And what I use the term least action pathways so that you can just identify them and say, oh, there's that least action pathway. Let that go by. Because, you know, I like the way that, uh, Alan, my husband says it, that, the thought gets there before you do. Now, this is really interesting because people try to change their thoughts or change anything. And there's a distinction in quantum think system called transformation as distinct from change. And this is really important in mastery because if you focus on those negative thoughts or those judgments, or those, you know, those things that we don't want to think that about people. I call it the myth of choice, that though we imagine we think freely, and we like to think of ourselves as independently, we know, we think we're choosing our thoughts, we're actually not most of the time, because of this old worldview mechanical conditioning. Even though in every moment, we have the opportunity, the ability to choose our thought, to the extent that they're coming in those least action pathways, those automatic ones, that's to the extent that we're not actually a choice. How do you know you're not a choice? Because as you said, Erlen, you wouldn't choose to have that kind of negative judgment on someone. Okay, so what this is what we're talking about here, getting a new relationship with your own thoughts. So as as Alan, my husband partner, says Uh, you know, it gets there before you do. So people try to change your thought. Well, you can't change the thought because the thought got there before, as you said, when you started meditating, which is great. I've been doing it for a very long time myself. That, and as I said, I consider it one of the very natural faculties of mind that we don't learn about in school, but thank goodness people are starting to teach it now to executives and to children. But anyway, getting back. So you cannot change your thought because it's already there. But what you can do is you can create a new relationship to those thoughts. And that's what happens. That's an aspect of what happens in meditation, as you said, because you become the watcher of your thoughts. And there is a a distinction in quantum think on this. It's called being centered. And, you know, the practice is becoming the watcher because when you, you could say simultaneously, we are the awareness, the unbounded awareness, that aspect of ourself which, is, which can become aware of our thoughts, which people call mindfulness. And at the same time, we are the individual self, the person, the persona, the personality that we call, you know, a man, a woman, Earl and Diane, and, that, and all the roles that we play in life. And this is the idea for me, Earl, of mastery, 
is that, you know, when you said, well, what happens when you have that thought? Does it instantly manifest? Well, what we focus on, we add mass to. I think of it like E equals MC squared. What we have attention on, we're adding energy to. We know that energy and mass are controvertible. They, they're the same. So the more energy you give something, the more mass you add to it, the more concrete it becomes, the more you make it real. Now, here's another area. So, so what I'm saying is when you get a new relationship with your own thinking, not in two ways that I'm talking about it, one is the whole system that's shaping us and being able to now condition ourselves to think from the more accurate, up-to-date, in sync with nature of nature and the world today. That's quantum thinking. And being able to distinguish when industrial age, analytical thinking, linear thinking, when is that? That's useful too. But being able to make that choice so that we're becoming masters of ourselves. Mm. And secondly, that's one relationship on the big overarching relationship. Secondly, are these individual thoughts that you and I are talking about is getting in relationship to them so that we don't have to own every thought and that we know that what creates anything is intent. So intent is always creating a resonance. We don't obviously have one intent. We have many. Right. And we could have an unaware intent, right? Mm. So something can be operating in the background. It's like if you have your computer, right? Or, you know, let's, let's talk about a cell phone. And you have all these operating systems open in the background that you forgot you had it open. And it's taking away some of the power of yes. your connectivity. It's like that. So when you become aware of the, this which, you've, which you are holding as if it is the absolute truth, mm. right? So, so um, guys, if you want to hear more, uh, you can go to dianecollins.com. Um, Diane, it has been a true pleasure having you on the show. Uh, this has been amazing uh, in terms of really understanding so much more um, about uh, something that I've kind of played around with and, and it's, it's helped me uh, manifest some things. It's been frustrating at other times. And you've really given me uh, so much more perspective on, um, on the quantum thinking. So uh, where can we get more information about you? Is, is dianecollins.com the best place to go for that? Yes, definitely dianecollins.com. <clears throat> Just to say thank you so much for having me, Erlen. It's re- I really appreciate the time and the space, the, the field that you're holding for me to express these ideas and, and my experience with them. And Diane is spelled with two N's, very mm. important. D-I-A-N-N-E-C-O-L-L-I-N-S dot com. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can also go to my LinkedIn page. I was thinking about that because uh, I've got some videos and some and articles on there. That There's an article on there, uh, Thinking Not As Usual, yeah. which really tells what new thinking is. Not just a new idea, but it's a new framework from which it thinks. So... But cool. Diane Collins has everything. It has access to my book, my blog on the Huffington Post, uh, you know, a lot of video and audios on there free. Awesome. So, yeah, Fantastic. thank you. So, guys, check out Do You Quantum Think on Amazon as well. Uh, and uh, have a beautiful day in Miami. Thank you so much. I look forward to future relationship with you. Absolutely. <laughs>